Welcome to this video on energy emission and absorption. Here in this video, part one is just an introduction to the Bohr model of the atom and understanding the terms emission and absorption spectra. Now, we're being dropped into the late 1800s here, where some names you might be familiar with, um, Ernst Rutherford, J.J. Uh, Thompson, Marsden, Geiger, a bunch of different uh, physicists and chemists were coming up with um, some really strange um, observations from lab data. And those observations were leading to an understanding of what the atomic structure was. And our basic atomic structure right here is that we found that there is a big cluster of mass in the middle of the building blocks of elements and that are, those are made up of protons and neutrons, protons having a positive charge, neutrons having no charge, and then electrons which are much much smaller surrounding this nucleus in some way but somehow loosely bound to this nucleus. Now this has not always been the observation that we have but what starts to happen is in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, we start to get some data that's very odd. And we need to be able to tie that data um, to some sort of explanation. Now, we've already talked about a lot of ways that light or waves, electromagnetic waves, which we now refer to as photons, are interacting with matter. And this is no different. In fact, that whole basis of the interaction between light and matter is what leads us to our structure that we have now. So if we take a look at this experiment, these two experiments done on a very basic level, and by the way, all the pictures are from openstacks.org. Um, they have some awesome pictures over there, and I have links in the description below so that you can check out um, their free physics textbooks um, so that you can learn some more. So if we shine some white light on a flask filled with a gas. When the light passes through the gas and then through a prism or through a diffraction grating, we'd expect to see a rainbow. Humankind has observed rainbows since really the beginning of time. And what we see here is that when it shines, when it first is filtered through the gas, that there's certain colors missing off of the rainbow. So I'm sure in the lab they try to figure out, well, are there any errors? Is there anything blocking this? But as they reduced error and possibilities of error and switched the flask with a different gas, they saw that different lines were missing for different elements. And there were never repetition in the barcode, so to speak, of the different gas elements. And so what they started to um, hypothesize was that the light and the matter were definitely interacting. That was the first thing. And that what Every light was not coming back out through the prism was being absorbed by that particular element. So the idea was that different elements only absorbed different photons of light. And the photons that were missing were the ones that were still with the gas, in a sense. Now, on the flip side of that, if we took a uh, gas and put it in a fancy flask, which is known as a discharge tube, we attach the ends of that, it's kind of like a light bulb, to a um, uh, potential difference or a voltage, and we got that voltage very high, we could excite the gas and it would glow. And the glowing of the gas, first of all, was a different color for different gases, but when that light coming from the gas tube itself was um, incident on a prism or a diffraction grating, we only saw um, here very specific emission lines. So not they didn't have a full spectrum, but only very specific light was emitted from that gas tube. So this idea of absorption that was different for different elements and was different emissions for different elements was a very strange idea. Now one of the things that we want to keep in mind here is that the classical idea of physics says that we should have a spectrum of possibilities. In other words, if I had say a ball on a ramp and I was trying to raise the ball to a certain height h, the ball could occupy any position, an infinite number of positions along this ramp, it was bounded by the length of the ramp. What the quantum model says is that it's not a spectrum and that 
the position is what we call quantized. That's the term quantum physics. If we think about the quantization of charge that we talked about before, we know that charge only comes in increments of the elementary charge or the charge of an electron. Now over here, quantum or quantized position in this example would mean that the ball could only exist on various steps to get it to height h. All the positions or the heights in between here were not observed. And so what that implied was that based on the different gas or the different element, there was a different sort of step structure and that you would only see emissions or absorptions based on the step structure. So what this does is it ties the structure of the atom to the idea of quantization and says that there must be something structurally occurring in the, atom, in the atom in order for there to be this very discrete and different absorption and emission spectrum. Here's a, an actual example of a hydrogen spectrum. There's a very faint purple line here that you can't really see. There's an aqua line, a violet line, and then this red line over here. Now in the next few videos, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at what's actually happening here. And that's going to be um, what Bohr, Niels Bohr, proposed and was published in 1913, which is now known as the Bohr model of the atom. And we'll get into all the details of that in the next few videos.